Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Kosciuszko Foundation's webinar, Written in the Margins, Zuzanna Ginchanka's Poetry in English Translation with Dr. Mira Rosenthal and Dr. Anna Miller. My name is Eva Zadvorna. I'm Vice President and Director of Cultural Affairs at the Kosciuszko Foundation. And I would like to welcome all our attendees who are joining us now on Zoom. The photograph that we've just shown that is featured on the poster announcing this webinar is most likely familiar to all who are watching us now and to all our viewers who have an interest in Polish literature. Recently, this picture has quite often been used by various organizations and institutions aiming to promote Polish culture, as well as by individuals who want to share the news or just simply to remind about the birth anniversary or other occasion that refers to Zuzanna Ginczanka, a brilliant Polish Jewish poet of the webinar of, of the interwar period, whose life was tragically cut short at the age of 27 when she was murdered by the Nazis shortly before the end of the World War II. Ignored and forgotten in post-war Poland, the poetry of Zuzanna Ginczanka was rediscovered and recognized after the collapse of communism. In the last two decades, and in the most recent years specifically, we can see a significant interest in life and body of work of Zuzanna Ginczanka in Poland. Much about her has been written, published, and presented to Polish audience. In 2015, the Museum of Literature in Warsaw hosted an exhibition devoted to the works of Zuzanna Ginczanka. In Krakow, a commemorative plaque was unveiled, unveiled and there is a theater production about her and the play continues to be presented. A year ago, a Polish singer, Joanna Longic, released a record that features her music written to poetry of Ginczanka, and there are many, many events and talks organized by various literary organizations in various cities and towns across Poland. To English speaking viewers, however, perhaps except for Ginczanka's most famous poem, which is Non Omnis Moriar, her work remains largely unknown. That is why we are very grateful to our guest speakers, Dr. Mira Rosenthal and Dr. Anna Miller for accepting our invitation to give this talk and present, present a picture of this enigmatic and sensational Polish writer and shine light on her poetry in English translation. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Mira Rosenthal, a poet, a past fellow of the National Endowment for the Arts and Stanford University Stegner Program. Her work uh, appears regularly in such journals as Poetry, Plowshares, Harvard Review, PN Review, Three Penny Review, A Public Space, and Oxford American. Her first book of poems, The Local World, received the Week Poetry Prize. And her second book, Territorial, was selected by Terence Hayes for the Pitt Poetry Series. Her translations of Polish poetry include Krystyna Dąbrowska's Tideline and Tomasz Różycki's Colonies, which won the Northern California Book Award and was shortlisted for numerous other prizes, including the International Griffin Poetry Prize. Her other honors include the Penn Heim Translation Fund Award, a Fulbright Fellowship, a grant from the American Council of Learned Societies, and residences at McDowell and Hedgebrook. And Dr. Anna Mueller is a historian, associate professor of history, and the Frank and Mary Pajeski endowed professor in Polish, Polish American, and Eastern European studies at the University of Michigan, Dearborn. She, she holds a master's degree from the University of Gdańsk in Poland and a PhD from Indiana University. Dr. Miller is the 2019 recipient of the Polish Institute of Arts and Sciences of America's Oskar Halecki Polish History Award for her book, If the Walls Could Speak, Inside a Women's Prison in Communist, Communist Poland. Among the awards she received are American Association of University Women Dis Dissertation Fellowship, Fulbright Hayes Doctoral Dissertation Research Abroad Grant, and the Kościuszka Foundation Polish Studies and Research Grant. Dear ladies, Anja, Mira, 
thank you very, very much for doing this, for accepting our invitation to give this talk. Welcome. And now the floor is all yours. Thank you. Thank you, Eva. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for the invitation, for giving us space to share uh, this work on this new project. So maybe I will say a couple of words about what we plan to uh, accomplish um, for today's meeting. Uh, I will introduce Rosanna Ginchanka, give us a little bit about her life and a little bit about of historical background. And I'll be heavily drawing from um, the works of her biography, biographers. Um, then um, that hopefully will take us to reflect a little bit on um, this recent phenomenon, if I can call it that way, of sort of interest in Ginchanka. And that will take us to a discussion um, or to, to actually the readings of um, the translations of her poetry um, and maybe a couple of words of this collaboration between um, the poet and historian um, Mira and I. Um, and I would like to begin with the words of um, Yaroslav Mikołajewski, a poet and one of many people um, who are fascinated with Zuzanna Ginchanka, who wrote, Zuzanna is the one who escapes, who is a refugee, a fugitive. Mikołajewski saw Ginchanka as someone we are constantly chasing. We are trying to understand who she is, what she stands for, uh, why we're so drawn by her, but we cannot because she keeps escaping us. And here um, I would like to share a couple of images with you. I don't have many images. I don't have many slides and I will begin. Um, so I'll start with this slide where it's a, uh, a screenshot of a movie done by um, um, someone who would know, Julian Bryan, who was in Poland also in September 1939, filming um, the beginning of the uh, Second World War. Here he is in Poland 1936, and it's a shot from a movie that he made at one of the parties. And I do apologize for the, the circle in the middle, but this photo just gives us this very blurred image of Ginchanka. And I think that in a sense that is sort of reflects this, this constant need of many, many people to understand who she is. And yet, you know, her, she somehow keeps escaping us. So um, it feels that whatever short introduction of her life we provide, it will never be enough. Um, another comment that I'll make on the photos, Mira and I decided not to show her photos and we'll keep returning to this issue of why not and um, why we decided not to uh, show how beautiful she is, because she's very often seen through the prism of her physicality, through the prism of her beauty, and we will talk about this a little bit more. Um, Zuzanna Ginchanka was uh, a Polish uh, Jewish poetess who was born in 1917 in Kiev, which was part of the Russian Empire at that point. She was born into a Russian-speaking family, uh, and in 1920, after Poland regains its independence, the uh, Russian revolution happened. Her parents decided to move to uh, Rivne, which you saw on this map as um, Rovno, um, where um, her grandparents lived, Ginchanka's grandparents lived. The marriage, the marriage of Zuzanna's parents uh, soon fell apart and then they got divorced in 1921 and moved on with their lives essentially leaving uh, Ginchanka behind to be raised by her grandmother. Um, Zuzanna was a very precocious child. Um, Russian was her first language. In Irivna, as soon as she got to Rivna, her grandmother um, signed her up for a French speaking daycare because it was well seen for uh, women from uh, good homes to uh, know French. Her mother, uh, her grandmother, I'm sorry, also, who cared very deeply about her education, uh, made sure that Ginchanka played piano, she took drawing lessons, and then she decided to send her to a Polish school. And this is a photo of a manuscript of one of Ginchanka's poems. Um, so in a sense, this gesture of sending Ginchanka to Polish speaking schools is very often interpreted as family's decision and also Ginchanka's decision to embrace the Polish language and um, culture. 
Susanna began writing and publishing poetry already as a teenager. And, and the poem you have in front of you is titled Bund Pietnastolata, right? The rebellion of the 15 years old, year old. Her first poem was published in 1933 in Kurier Literatsko Naukowy, uh, in addition to uh, Ilustrowane Kurier Codzienne. So she was a very young woman who was in a, in a sense rewriting the world around her and the norms um, that define it. In 1935, as an 18-year-old, she moved to study in Warsaw. Uh, and this was actually in Warsaw uh, where she encountered various forms of anti-Semitism, something she did not know from, uh, from Rivna. Uh, in 1936, she published her first volume of poetry about centaurs, or centaurach. Uh, when the war began in 1939, she was actually uh, in uh, Ruvne. She moved from Ruvne to Lviv, where she met Michal Weinsayer, uh, who she married. And this was uh, welcomed by her friends and uh, friends with a surprise because um, she was in a relationship with a different man. But many of her biographers and people that studied her life uh, in details um, think that, you know, he was, um, he was, quite powerful person and the hope for her was that with, um, you know, through this relationship, she would be able to save her grandmother. Um, from Ruvna, as I mentioned, she met, moved to Lviv where she was uh, in 1942 denounced by Hominova. Um, she managed to escape that arrest um, and she escaped from Lviv. And then later on, she, the, the Omnis Mor non Omnis Morier, the poem that Eva mentioned, one of um, her most famous poem was actually sort of stirred by, by uh, this act of being denounced by, uh, by a woman named Hominova. And she's mentioned directly in this poem. Throughout the war, she continued searching for a good um, hiding place from Lviv. She moved back to Warsaw and then to Krakow. And in Krakow, she pretended to be an Armenian woman sort of, again, trying to hide her looks. And, um, you know, because her origins, the way she looked, uh, could have betrayed her. But it was in Krakow where she was finally arrested by the Gestapo and um, most likely executed in Płaszów in 1944. Uh, we know that the execute that between the fall of 1943 and um, 1944 uh, in Krakow, there was a number of uh, arrests and mass executions of people who were mostly taken from prisons in uh, Montelupi. Um, and that's why, you know, uh, and actually Mont uh, Płaszów was turned into a concentration camp in, in January 1944. And yet still, even at that point, a lot of executions of people who were arrested um, was going on. Um, we don't know much about her last days um, in prison. Um, there are some testimonies, some almost gossips, very anecdotes that are difficult, very difficult to verify. Um, according to some of them, <laughs> she was hoping that she would be taken to Płaszów and from there to Auschwitz. So she was aware of the existence of Auschwitz and she was hoping that maybe if she is taken to Auschwitz, she would be able um, to survive. But with time, it was becoming less and less possible because at some point Auschwitz stopped accepting new prisoners because it was, you know, getting full and uh, it was in a process of liquidation. So again, this is a very short version of her biography. Um, just to indicate that there are many layers to her story that we could try to uncover and distangle, disentangle, and yet there seems to be sort of always new questions emerging um, that um, keeps resonating with us. And now I would like to say a little bit about um, her via her biographers. Um, here's another slide. I'll come back to this photo again. Uh, here are three books about Ginchanka, um, three biographies of Ginchanka. And I will try to say a little bit more about her through uh, those works. One of the first people who began recovering Pinchanka from silence, from the silence, and who was sort of rebuilding her image from the fragments of information that she was able to find was Isolda Kelts. The first book by Kelts, um, titled Zunzanna Ginchanka Życie i Twórczość, this is the one on the left, um, the white cover. 
And again, you can notice that there's actually no photos of Kinchanka on the covers of these books, as the authors are sort of having very similar thoughts to us that, you know, her image is very often misleading. You see her as a beautiful, smiling woman while she's carrying this, this incredible, incredible burden and a number of anxieties with her. Kets's first book came out in uh, 1994. And she was also trying to bring Inchankas um, to sort of the public awareness by publishing um, volumes of her poetry. And in one of the interviews, Kat said that her work on Ginchanka is one of the most important meetings in her life. And I think we often see those encounters with Ginchanka uh, in terms of meetings, something that uh, pushes us to sort of revisit um, our stances on things happening around us. So it's always seems to be much larger than just Kinchanka's story. Uh, Ket said that this meeting continues to affect her life. And it's also a reason why over two decades later, Ginchan Ket, I'm sorry, decided to write a new book, book on Ginchanka as a continuation of that meeting, meeting testimony to the impact that Ginchanka had on her, but also sort of changing uh, worldviews and evolving with our understanding of who Ginchanka uh, was. And on the right, you see sort of the newest uh, biography in Ginchanka. I have it um, with me here. If we were in the same room, I would love to pass this book um, around now. Um, Kat said, I would like to quote her here. She said in one of the interviews, uh, quote, I, I continue meeting her all the time. And each time I meet her, she's different, end of quote. And it feels like this is also a good motto for why Mira and I decided to work on this project. Uh, we met her on our own terms, uh, but we also met each other through, uh, through Ginchanka. So in 2020, two years ago, uh, after 26 years, Kat published another book that I just mentioned, uh, Ginchan Kanyu Pilnui Me Nikt, um, a title that's referring to one of her poems, and we'll speak about this later as well. Um, she also published a new book of um, poetry of Ginchanka, sort of fuller, uh, containing uh, a lot of poems that her first books of poetry didn't contain. And that book sort of refocuses, deepens our understanding of who Ginchanka was, how Ket saw Ginchanka, what kind of conditions, uh, circumstances, conditions Ginchanka's life and um, death. The book, the second book, the one on the right, on, and this is, no, this is not, this is the one. I'm not sure whether your right is my right. That's why I keep showing this book. Uh, according to kids, Ginchanka experienced several betrayals throughout her life, and we should see her through those disappointments, major disappointments. First of all, she was betrayed by her father, who very, very early on abandoned the family and emigrated to America. Then she was also betrayed by her mother, who married a much younger man and potentially felt that um, Ginchanka's charm, her beauty, um, could have been an obstacle in this relationship. And then hence she decided also to leave and left Ginchanka with her grandmother. Um, again, Ginchanka was a very beautiful woman that attracted many men. Um, so she, throughout her very short life, she encountered a lot of interest from men, but as Kate shows, none of them loved her enough or perhaps loved her in the way she needed to be, to be loved. Um, and perhaps in this story, the most telling is uh, the betrayal of Yusef Wobodowski, a man she loved, a man who loved her, but who decided not to marry her because his mother and sister refused to accept um, a Jewish wife for, for him. So that's sort of another betrayal in her life. Uh, then there is, of course, a story of sort of one of the most famous betrayal of Hominova, um, the event, the woman that betrayed her when she lived in, denounced her when she was in Lviv, um, an, an event and then inspired um, this most famous Nchanka's poems, uh, Non Omnis Moriar, something that Eva already mentioned. And in a sense, sort of speaking to all those betrayals, she was really betrayed by her own looks, by her face, right? Uh, she was very beautiful, but she had a very Semitic, Semitic face and she could not go unnoticed. Um, she was often noticed as very beautiful, very Jewish looking, hence very exotic woman. 
And from increasing body of works on the Holocaust in Poland, uh, we know what that meant in the wartime Poland, um, that looks, Jewish looks attracted attention and sometimes help meant as little as averting gaze, sort of lack of vigilance towards strangers that look different. And unfortunately, Shanka didn't have that luck, didn't have that luck. Um, she was actually attracting un unwanted attention uh, because of her looks. So soon after Ketz's first book, the one that was published in 1994, uh, Agata Arashkevich, and that book is in the middle on the slide, a literature specialist and a philosopher published her work on Ginchanka. And it's a very different book that is really less focused on biography and, um, and rather is sort of interpretation of Ginchanka's life in, in light of her work, her poetry, but also a number of uh, literary theories. And it's a very sort of interesting book that invites us to a conversation about what it means to be Polish and what it means to write Polish literature. Arashkiewicz sees Ginczanka as someone very radical, uh, a person who, Ginczanka didn't have a Polish uh, citizenship. So in many respects, she's coming to Polish literature from the margins as a woman, as a Jew, as a poetess, as a non pole um, And from those margins, she's sort of claiming her place as a Polish poetess, uh, a Pole by choice. And through that choice, she's actually challenging many literary traditions um, while participating in this process of feminization of the Polish writings at that time. time. So clearly she's tradi challenging traditional ways of seeing the world. She's destabilizing a number of meanings uh, and invites us hopefully, and that's something I hope you will see um, from uh, the translation of Kinchanka's poetry by Mira, that she invites us to reflect on place of women poets, stigmatization um, that is sometimes caused by beauty or different looks. Uh, also women, men relationships, the relations be between um, a human and animals or humans and nature. Um, she speaks a lot about the duality of human conditions, duality of spiritualism, sensualism. So she's really inviting a lot of themes that have power of destabilizing um, traditional meanings. And here, uh, a little bit more about her beauty. Uh, again, she was a very beautiful woman and attracted the male gaze jealousy, uh, passions. And in a sense, she often felt, or we think she felt because she expressed that through her poetry, objectified by men as um, a beautiful woman. And here again, I can emphasize that, you know, what we see sometimes as a beautiful woman with sparkling eyes and a big smile is deceiving. And I think those photos um, can be deceiving if we don't really uh, know much about her. And then I think this is the moment maybe to share this photo because here you see her with her best friend uh, from a profile, again, a little blurred image that doesn't, that doesn't give us a sense of um, you know, her physical appearance and leaves a little bit of uh, mystery maybe. Um, so I'm almost, I'm, I'm almost done. So one of the categories that Arashkevich is using while analyzing Minchanka's work is that of melancholy, this deep sadness that reaches the essence of one's being. Uh, and from that perspective, seeing her through melancholy, that helps us see her as a person uh, in the world of imposed various identities, a beautiful woman, a Jew, who is struggling to remain uh, the author, author of her own story, to cope with her own conditions, to sort of go beyond the conditions that define her. And there are really two ways of reading Arashkevich's interpretation. On the one hand, it's sort of this very universal way of reading this story uh, about people who are not representing the mainstream who are coming from the margins and their ways of finding, trying to find space for themselves. On the other hand, her work and her biography can be seen as a challenge to the Polish mainstream, right? To, can be sort of seen in the context of Polish particularities. Um, and those challenges can be read as a way or an attempt to actually widen what Polishness means, making it again, more intersectional, more inclusive. And I think uh, it's probably a good moment to also say that we are the moment when Ginchanka is becoming mainstream. She's not in the margins anymore. There's incredible interest, a couple of slides. Um, here are some of the volumes of 
uh, her poetry that have appeared since her death and other books that sort of speak to some kind of fascination with Ginchanka. And there's many, many more. The market is actually full in Poland, full of works in Ginchanka. Ginchanka is almost widely known in Poland right now. So the question is, of course, why? And maybe I'll say a couple of words why I, how I see it from the perspective of a historian, and then I will pass the floor to, to Mira. So I think her changing place is related to changing place of Jews in Polish discourse and ongoing sort of discoveries of difficult yet inseparable ball, bonds between Poles and Jews and Polish and Jewish history. And her story, her life is part of this conversation about of those difficulties um, between those relationships between Poles and Jews and also the wrongdoings that Poles committed against uh, the Jews. And this is also something that uh, speaks sort of about the ongoing conversation on belonging and identity that is actually happening in Poland right now, right? Um, and the fact that many contemporary Poles are questioning those traditional models and are trying to find alternatives that are more civic and less based on uh, ethnic belonging. Thank you, Anya. Uh, this is exactly the reason why I love collaborating with you and collaborating with a historian as a poet, uh, having that fullness of background is so uh, helpful and also causes me to jot down so many notes to remember as I'm working on the poems. Um, I want to say just a little bit about what got me interested in Ginchanka, and then we'll turn to looking at some of the translations that Anya and I have been working on. Um, I came to Polish literature uh, through a love and fascination with the post-war Polish poets. Um, and uh, of course, through that interest, uh, went into studying a lot about World War II. Uh, but that interest in study was for me often a little bit um, uh, dissociated from my own heritage and my own Jewish background. I think with uh, Ginchanka, I find my own personal background much more present. And that's something that um, one of the reasons why I'm interested in spending time with her work um, and also some of the things that Anya and I are doing around how we're, we are contextualizing the poems in relation to our approaches as in, in bringing her work into English. Um, so I was aware of the rediscovery of Ginchanka's work and really loved the linguistic density and exuberance of her poetry. Um, but also uh, felt a bit overwhelmed by that linguistic density and exuberance when thinking about the possibility of rendering her poems in English. Um, so uh, when I found out that Anya was also interested in her from a historical perspective, I immediately said, help, uh, let's, let's think about this together. I wonder if there are ways that we might uh, talk through the poems, uh, both on a linguistic level, but also on a um, historical level and see how that might inform a way to present her work in English. Since we started working on this project a couple of years ago, uh, I have uh, become aware of a couple of other people who are also working on bringing Ginchanka's poetry into English, which is great. Hopefully there will be a Ginchanka Renaissance in uh, English language sources soon enough. Um, of course, the best possible worlds in relation to literature and translation is to have multiple translations of any given poem. Um, the fact that there might be uh, more than one volume of her work in English also liberates our project, liberates our choices in that we're not beholden to uh, this sense of needing to present some sort of definitive volume that is the first volume introducing her work. Uh, so we've, we've been approaching this project um, wanting to provide some um, more of a contextual apparatus of commentary that is both uh, drawing on the history, but also drawing on the, the personal reckoning that her work uh, asks us to do, certainly asks me to do as a Jewish and American poet. Um, 
I'll start by, uh, well, let me share my screen and uh, start with a, a poem that picks up on one of the themes that Anya has already um, uh, mentioned, this idea of betrayal. Can um, and as I am presenting these five poems, I'll use them to also orient you to some of the um, ways that we've been uh, thinking about her poems in terms of thematic categories. The first category being this sense of betrayal or loss. Um, and Anya will read the poem first in Polish, and then I'll read the English and point out a few uh, translation conundrums and things that we were thinking about. So now I know why I'm so nervous. Becoming an actor is, is what is actually causing the anxiety, but I'll try. Um, zdrada. Nie, nie upilnuje mnie nikt. Grzech z zamszu i nietoperzy zawisł na strychach strachu półmy się głową w dół. O zmierzchu wymknę się z wieży, z warownej ucieknę wieży, przez cięcie ostrych os, przez zasiek zatrutych ziół. Ciężko powstaną z rumowisk tłoczące turnie przykazań. Dwadzieścia piekieł wedy, płomienie, wycie i świst. Noc fanatyczna zagrozi, zakiemieniuje gwiazdami. Rtęcią wyślizgnę się z palców. Nie upilnuje mnie nic. Ty w wilka się zmienisz, ja w pliszkę. Ty w orła, ja w kręte dziwy. Nieprzeniknionym zamysłem uprzedzę każdy twój pościsk. Nie upilnuje mnie świat. O luby, o drogi, o miły. Jeśli nie zechcę sama, słodkiej, majowej wierności. Betrayal. No one will be guarding me. Sin made of leather and bats hangs down its half a mouse head in fear-filled attics. At dusk, I'll slip from the tower, break free of this fortified tower through the bite of sharp wasps, through the tangle of poisonous herbs. Crowded peaks of commandments will push from the rubble. Twenty Vedic hells will rise, flaming, wailing, shrieking, fanatical night threatening a stoning by stars. I'll slip away with quicksilver. Nothing will be guarding me. If you turn wolf, I'll be a wagtail bird. If you turn eagle, I'll be a jumble of surprises. With impenetrable thought, I'll thwart each way you chase. The world will not be guarding me, O oh love, O oh dear, O oh darling, if I do not desire myself, may sweet fidelity. So I wanna point out a few things that I was thinking about in relation to how to, uh, things that I felt were really important to capture in the English version. The first being a uh, use of repetition. You see that here with through the bite, through the tangle, but also with this repetition of no one that changes to nothing, that changes to the world. That sense of, uh, that use of the rhetorical strategy of anaphora is common throughout Aginchanka's work, and you'll see that in the poems that we're presenting today. So that felt really important to uh, retain in whatever uh, wrenching around of grammar was happening and bringing it into English. There's also a kind of strangeness that I, I, have to I have to fight against my urge to smooth out her poems. Um, my, own, my own voice as a poet uh, is very uh, rhythmic and sonically dense and probably smoother than Ginchanka's voice. Uh, so I see that in moments like um, this third line here, this strange half a mouse head, for example, um, 
but you do at the same time, there is a musicality and a kind of energy in that musicality to her work that I was trying to capture with alliterative qualities like hang and half or fear field addicts. You also hear the assonance of half and addicts. So as I'm translating, I'm always aware of those elements within the English that are not uh, that, that are not necessarily uh, direct equivalents, but are trying to capture that same sign, kind of linguistic strangeness and energy that I spoke about. Um, and then, of course, there's always kind of translation conundrums. I think we we spoke so often of this jivni, jivi uh, in the in the original. What what might those wonders or strange things be? How can we render that in English? Right now, I have that as surprises. Um, that idea of thwarting, kind of connecting it with the idea of thwarting in the poem. But more generally, in terms of this uh, broader theme of betrayal or loss that we notice in a lot of the poems, here I find this poem really fascinating with the way it's, it's connecting betrayal to desire. This is a kind of consideration of the general uh, mechanism of betrayal, but through uh, how that, that uh, happens within uh, romantic or uh, moments of desire. And I love the way that uh, she, at the end of the poem, is thwarting the mechanism of betrayal by not even subscribing to uh, desire in the first place. Uh, so she doesn't have to think about or, or kind of sidesteps that whole idea of fidelity, faithfulness, and unfaithfulness by saying, if I don't desire it in the first place, then I uh, don't have to worry about being betrayed. So it's an interesting kind of self-defense mechanism. Um, the next poem uh, really uh, picks up on this, but through that sense of agency that we feel coming through that sidestepping that she's doing in the first poem. So the second theme that I would point to is agency. Um, and that this is really an important concept for her, uh, specifically an agency that she claims through language first, that thing that uh, Anya spoke about, about uh, conscious choice to to write pol in Polish, but also an agency that she finds through joy. Uh, and this poem speaks to that. So we can hear it first in the Polish. Mitologia radosna. Jak atlas dźwigam hardo na barkach własne niebo, wzwyż się przedłużam pionem, azotu, pary, tlenu, Barometr serca krew ciśnie jak rtęczne srebro, by zmierzyć ciężar szczęść na skali pulsu przemów. Lecz nie znam wcale cyfr, o których cyrkle, cyrkle prawią. Nie znam wcale liczb barometrycznych ciśnień, gdy nocą brzemię nieb w konarach moich ramion zakwita jaśnią gwiazd jak drobno kwietnią wiśnią. To nie jest lada sztuczka udźwignąć własne szczęście. Radośnie, świętokracko, nie ugiąć się pod niebem. Jak atlas dźwigam hardo na barkach siną przestrzeń, na której słońce zmiedzi jaskrami, znaczy przebieg. Mythology of joy. Like atlas, with pride I bear on these shoulders my sky. Lengthening high along a plumb line of nitrogen, of vapor, of oxygen, heart barometer forcing blood like silver mercury to measure the weight of happiness on this scale of pulsing speech. But what do I know of digits the circle compass marks? And what do I know of units for atmospheric pressure when at night the burden of sky in the boughs of these arms blooms with shining stars like tiny flowers in a cherry tree? This is quite the trick to bear my own happiness joyfully, sacrilegiously, to not buckle under the sky. Like Atlas, with pride I bear on these shoulders a blue expanse through which the copper sun turns buttercups to mark 
the way. As you can see uh, in the previous poem and in this poem, her poems often come to these very skinny ends that are built of single word lines, which is a, a challenge to uh, do in English, partly because of the way, for example, the case of Yaskrami can convey using buttercups, which gets uh, more wordy in English. Uh, so that's a challenge that I'm, I find myself working with a lot in her poems to um, convey this, this kind of, uh, zooming in of the microscope lens uh, to turn these ideas very carefully so that they have kind of layers of different meanings. Um, the, uh, this poem, I was again thinking about some of the uh, anaphora, some of that repetition of phrasing, uh, which is again part of her rhetoric. Um, but what do I know and what do I know here in the second stanza felt important to uh, preserve. Um, I was also really interested in the idea uh, that she's bearing this happiness sacrilegiously. One way that that comes through in this poem and with other poems is that she's interested in contradiction. This is a joyfulness that has a weight that needs to be born in some way. So both uh, something that's light and something that's heavy. Um, and in particular, I find the idea of it being sacrilegious to pick up on some of her other interests of um, reinvestigating set narratives that are given to us. Uh, in particular, this often happens in relation to set narratives from fairy tales or biblical narratives, which we see in this next poem, uh, which plays around with um, biblical language. So this is a third theme uh, that we more are broadly thinking about in terms of a dialectic. She's interested in having a uh, intertextual dialectic going on uh, within her poems. Sometimes that's with biblical narratives and texts. Sometimes that's with um, other um, poems, often written by men, uh, canonical poems that the, she's then investigating and speaking to and speaking back to. Uh, we've mentioned a couple of times her most famous poem, Non Omnis Moriar. Uh, that poem has an intertextual dialectic that's going on within it as well. But this poem, I think right away, you'll hear how it's interested in playing around with that biblical language. Wyjaśnienie na marginesie. Nie powstałam z prochu, nie obrócę się w proch. Nie stąpiłam z nieba i nie wrócę do nieba. Jestem sama niebem, tak jak szklany strop. Jestem sama ziemią, tak jak rodna gleba. Nie uciekłam znikąd i nie wrócę tam. Oprócz samej siebie nie znam innej dali. W zdętym płucu wiatru I w złapnieniu skał muszę siebie tutaj rozproszoną znaleźć. Written in the margins. I was not taken from dust to dust. I will not turn back. I did not descend from heaven and I will not return there. Here I am a woman myself, the sky like a glass ceiling. Here I am the ground, like fertile earth. I did not flee out of nowhere, and I will not return there. I know no other distance than myself. Inside this swollen lung of wind and this calcified stone, I alone must find my scattered self. I think you maybe can hear why we use this poem as the title for our talk. Uh, I think this is a really beautiful and 
uh, a poem that uh, affects me even physically. Uh, that's one thing that um, I'm always thinking about in relation to poetry in general. How is it an experience that is marked as speech that is different and unique from everyday speech that works on us even physically, gives us an emotional and physical response. I think that's also an important concept to, to hold on to with Ginchanka's work, especially because she's a poet who's interested in the senses, interested in the way in which the physical and the mental are in dialogue and coexisting. Um, I'll point out a few things here. As I mentioned, we have this biblical language at the beginning. So I was playing around with various, various versions of how to ring chime in the English ear dust to dust. Um, and also I was thinking about gender with this poem. Here I am, you might notice, oh, I've added a woman which is not technically in that line in the Polish, but this is one thing that's always a challenge when translating from Polish into English. How do I deal with the fact that this verb over here, stąpiłam, tells me that it's a woman speaking? Uh, so I look for ways to insert that information in some way. Uh, in this line, I was also bringing up here, because I got rid of it down here in the poem, as you might, might notice. Uh, so parts get moved around sometimes a little bit as I'm working to uh, convey um, some of the parts of the poem, maybe not necessarily in the same places. Uh, this poem, in the, for this poem, we talked a lot about glass ceiling because obviously that has a, uh, particular uh, uh, meaning in English, the glass ceiling of wages uh, past which women are, aren't, don't go. Uh, and that's not necessarily the meaning in the Polish, but we decided that that might be an interesting resonance uh, that wasn't, or at least it was not a problematic resonance to allow to exist in the English language version. It's one of the interesting ways that poems in being um, uh, brought into other language, maybe lose some of their layers of meaning that exist in the original, but gain other layers of meaning. And the question for me is always, is this appropriate? Does this work in this poem? Um, and then finally, I would uh, just mention my general uh, understanding or reading of this poem has to do with, with this expanse of self that is really important in her work. Um, Anya said something at the beginning of this idea that, that Ginchanka is someone who we're constantly um, chasing uh, or Kietz's idea that she's continually meeting Ginchanka. I would say in some way, Ginchanka is also constantly chasing herself and constantly meeting herself in these poems. Who am I? What is this, as the term that we would use today is what is this intersectionality of self that I'm experiencing as a woman, as a Jew, but who also uh, is writing in Polish, but knows other languages. Uh, so we have a line like, I know no other distance than myself, which you might notice is the longest line in the poem which was very important to me to also for have, have it be the longest line in the English version. This line where that's contained on one line, period at the end, uh, but it's talking about the vastness of self, the distance of self. This next poem picks up on that idea of the self as this vastness, this, in, this, in this next poem, it's the self as a city. Um, and uh, yeah, in the interest of time, we can just launch right into the poem. Uh, this is uh, picking up on the theme of place that Ginchanka often is thinking about in her poems. Zamiast różowego listu. Moje malutkie miasto ma zbyt wiele uliczek. Nie mogę ciebie spotkać, choć co dnia wszystkie liczę. Moje malutkie miasto ma uliczek za mało. Nie ma w niej takiej jednej, by się dwoje spotkało. Moje malutkie miasto mogło stać nad tysiącem, które mają chodniki długo, długo idące, 
A nad każdą by stało smukłych domów miliony, jak dynie pełne pestek drobiem ludzkiem zmrowionych. A każda co dzień inna, pełna Twego kochania, mogła święto spotkania na tych domach wyzwaniać. Na tych domach ogromnych, kolorowych klawiszach. A my byśmy szli wiecznie, a w nas byłaby cisza. Moje malutkie miasto mogło stać nad króciutką, tylko jedną, jedyną jak strumyczek wąziutką, a uliczka ta mogła mieć tylko dwa domeczki na przeciwne, radosne, roześmiane dzwoneczki. Moglibyśmy wyjść sobie w jakiś wieczór lub ranek z naszych domków, śmieszyczek, radośnianek, wieśnianek i od razu się spotkać, serco dzwonnie, dłoń w dłonnie i patrzeć sobie w oczy wiecznie, wiecznie, dozgonnie. Moje malutkie miasto ma zbyt mało uliczek i zbyt wiele uliczek, których nigdy nie zliczę. Instead of a rosy letter. My tiny town has way too many side streets. I count them each day, yet where can we meet? My tiny town has way too few of these routes, not a single one for a chance encounter. My tiny town could have stood a thousand more with sidewalks that reach very, very far, with millions of slender houses down each side, like pumpkins full of seeds teeming with human life. Each day, your love would fill a street with echo, chiming the feast of meeting on those homes, playing those homes of huge, colorful ivories. And we would go eternally within us a hush. My tiny town could have stood a wee street, just one, one like a very narrow stream. And it would have but two small houses, opposite joyful laughing bells ringing out, And we'd go out some evening or some morning from our houses, amuselings, joylings, springlings, and straight away we'd meet heart ringingly, hand graspingly, and look each other in the eye, eternally, eternally, everlastingly. My tiny town has too few side streets and too many side streets that I will never be able to count. Just a few things that I would point out here that are things that uh, we didn't necessarily see in the other poems. Rhyme. Uh, here we see an example of her chiming and rhyming, uh, which you hopefully hear in the English. Streets, meets, routes, encounter, more, far, side, life. But in the uh, in rhyming in English, I'm usually using a slant rhyme, uh, often an assonantal rhyme where the vowel rhymes but not the consonant. Uh, also, you see the that uh, energy and exuberance of this uh, moment down here, where she's playing around with uh, neologisms. Uh, which were a lot of fun and also completely hair pulling to try to figure out how to render in the English. We, Anya and I had a lot of fun uh, trying to come up with options. Uh, the last thing I would say about this poem, partly because I'm very excited about it, uh, is the, I, I would point out the final line. Again, this poem is about a self that is full of contradictions, a self that in a sense, the, the uh, self living within the self can never Never fully explore. It's too vast, but uh, there's not enough of it at the same time. Um, the last line is actually a line I just hit on in uh, preparing for this presentation that I will never be able to count. Uh, and I think that has an interesting resonance with the question of can I count more in general in my life? in my relationships, in my society, in my culture. Uh, and that's a question that I think is hovering uh, in, in, in particular in relation to what we know of her life and her biography. Uh, I'll just leave, uh, end with one last poem. And this is the title poem from her one uh, full collection that was published during her lifetime, Oats and Taurach. Um, and, uh, Yeah, I think, um, oh, the one thing I would say is that I think of this poem as a kind of ars poetica, especially the first line, that this is in some sense defining the kind of poetry that Genchanka is trying to write. 
o centaurach. Ścierają się rym o rym ostrzone wiersze ze szczękiem. Nie ufaj ścisłym rozmysłom, by żaden cię nie opętał. Nie ufaj palcom jak ślepcy, ni oczom jak sowy bez ręki. Oto głoszę namiętność i mądrość, ciasno w pasie zrośnięte, jak centaur. Wyznaję dostojną harmonię męskiego torsu i głowy z rozrosłym ciałem ogiera i cienką pęciną nogi. Do żeńskich chłodnych policzków i kłębów okrągłych kobył galopują wspaniałe centaury w dzwonie podków z łąk mitologii. Ich namiętność skupioną i mądrą, i ich mądrość płomienną jak rozkosz, odnalazłam w dostojnej harmonii i stopiłam w pasie i sercu. Popatrz, namysł o twarzy antycznej zgrzanym konią zawierzył swą boskość. Ekspętane rumaki po jaskrach drżące zmysły pędzą po czerwcu. Of centaurs. Line sharpen rhyme on rhyme, grind down with a clang. Don't trust in narrow thought, so nothing can possess you. Don't trust your fingers like blind men or your eyes like owls without hands. I'm giving voice to passion and sense, united at the waist like a centaur. I believe in the dignified harmony of a man's torso and head with a stallion's broad body and slender pastern joints to the cool feminine jawline and rounded withers of the mares, the splendid centaurs are galloping, horseshoes ringing from mythological meadows. I found their sensible and attentive passion and their sense fervent as immense pleasure to be in dignified harmony, and I melted alloy at the waist in the heart. Look, a thought with classical features entrusts its divinity to sweaty horses. Like tethered steeds in the buttercups, my trembling senses rush into June. I think I'll leave it there and uh, open up the floor to uh, conversation and questions. Thank you very, very much, um, Mira and Anya for this very interesting, informative talk and for sharing your insights with, with our audience. And I see, I can see that we received um, some of uh, them, some of questions. So perhaps I'll begin from the question from Jarosław Anders, who asks, how do you deal with Ginchanka's intricate, sneaky use of rhymes? How do you try to compensate for them in those places where it isn't possible to reduce them in English? I love those types of technical questions because it's what I spend my time doing in spending an hour thinking about one or two words and how to, how to best render them in, in English. Um, and I, I am a poet who's very attuned to what I call sonic texture. Uh, that texture comes through for me, not necessarily only in end rhyme. In fact, I'm not so interested in full end rhyme. Uh, in English, it often sounds old fashioned and clunky. Um, so I'm interested in presenting Ginchanka's voice as one that is, um, uh, not necessarily contemporary, but one that is challenging and exploring and um, more a bit more experimental. Um, that said, I'm always looking for ways to bring out those chimes and rhymes through assonance and consonants and those internal structures within the English. Um, I do find that sometimes uh, people who are uh, native Polish speakers are looking more for the full rhymes and uh, and uh, and I feel like if those aren't there, then the rhyme isn't there. But believe me, the rhyme is there all over the place. Um, it's just maybe um, chiming in slightly different ways than than you might expect because English works differently in terms of its sonic texture. We have a question. Do you know what do you think about the English translation of Vinchanga's poetry by Marek Kamierski? Um, so I, I am really, as I said, I am very happy that there are hopefully soon going to be multiple translations 
into English. Because ultimately, in a way, when you can compare translation multiples, it's almost like you're, you're, you're getting closer and closer to touching the original, even though you can't read the original. Uh, and you see the different ways that each translator has navigated those translation, uh, mediated the, the original. Um, and so then you can have a conversation about that. Uh, I think those, you know, the thing that I'm always thinking about when translating Ginchanka is how to not make her sound quaint. I think it partly because she's dealing with, she's this poet writing about love and using a lot of nature imagery. That could easily sound trite and quaint, but she's not trite and quaint. And so to me, that's the biggest challenge. Um, and then also, as I mentioned, maybe not holding so tightly to rhyme as a way to allow a sense of linguistic play and density to be felt in the English. Thank you. So now from the questions to a poet, let's move to a question to a poet and a historian. <laughs> How, did, how do the two of you work together on these translations? A poet and a historian, asks Patrice Dombrowski. <laughs> Anya. You want me to start? Um, yeah, yeah that's, a, that's, a, that's a good question. <laughs> because like I keep questioning myself, what am I doing here? Um, we, so the, in, the, initially the way it started, um, I, uh, it started by us talking about poetry. I did use poetry um, in my previous work as a historian. I think poetry is a great uh, primary source that is oftentimes underutilized. Um, I was looking, for example, in my first book on um, in incarcerated women in uh, post-war uh, Poland, I looked at their poetry uh, because they were in conditions where uh, they often um, had to, didn't have space and resources to actually write it down, they had to memorize it. And this was the way of sometimes expressing the emotions and we don't have any other um, um, uh, sources to look at, you know, anger, frustration, hope, um, failed hopes, right? Uh, and yet there's sort of this very long tradition, especially in Eastern Europe of reciting poetry, uh, gathering around poetry, expressing emotions uh, around poetry. Um, so the way we, we've been working so far, we, throughout the entire pandemic, we would meet um, usually on Fridays and we would read a poem. And this is how it started, us reading a poem together, sort of thinking how we render it in English. We are friends from before pandemic, from before pandemic, that sounds strange. We are friends from long time ago. We went together to graduate school to do two different programs and we were not in touch for many years. And then sort of Inchanka brought us together and it turned out that while talking about, you know, different words, how do you render this? in English, what does it mean? How do we understand this? What is the context of a given sentence, a word? We started discovering ourselves. So we find you know, our modern lives in Ginchanka's in poetry. So this co collaboration sort of started as you know, friends talking about some poems. Then we started thinking about actually translating those poems. And it's, you know, as you can imagine, uh, Mira's job. Like I just serve here as a good background. That's, that's all I do. But as a historian, I am, I think my role, and I'm sort of tr constantly trying to reinvent myself and write myself into the story, is that I keep thinking about historical context, you know, when certain poems were created, what are the historical factors that sort of could have affected her at a given moment. But I think I also think about, you know, individual agency in sort of in the middle of historical storm, the choices we make, right, and what it means for us. Um, decades later, how we sort of found herself, find herself in, in those words and what we do with those words as, you know, a poet uh, and a historian. And that's why I will say just one more sentence. I think this project may be different from all the other translations that are appearing that we do plan on including sort of uh, essays around, um, you know, working together, um, the themes that are resonating with us, um, also questions of you know historical agency and thinking of uh, poetry as historical sources and how can they be um, useful for us. So we have themes uh, that help us organize this poetry that also help us sort of think of 
um, questions that resonated with us throughout this process. So we're trying to document the process as much as, as the poetry. Yeah, and, and I would add on to that this idea of approaching her work from this perspective of third generation Holocaust survivors. Uh, this third generation perspective for me of what kind of resonances, how are these poems speaking to me as someone who grew up with a father who thought that all Jews could never really settle down and all Jews lived fleeing. Um, and, and really allowing the project to be one of conversation and friendship and also personal reckoning. Um, of course, it's, I don't want that to overshadow the poems, but I also think that it's an important context to think about in relation to questions, for me at least, of what does it mean that we're yet again going back and rediscovering a dead Jew? Um, what is problematic about that, that process that we continually do? Therefore, how might I also be present as a living Jew? Um, how might I also be present as the translator who is mediating these poems? In the field of translation theory, we might think about this as what we call a thick translation strategy. Um, so our commentaries will come into the process as well. But I will also just add, I'm so absolutely grateful to be doing this project with Anya because it's the first time that I'm working on poetry of someone who was writing uh, in the past and who I can't go to to ask questions. <laughs> I, have, I have focused as a translator on contemporary Polish literature. And so I always have the poet him or herself to go back to, to, to ask, what did you mean here? They don't always even have an answer. They often say, I don't know what I meant there, <laughs> but at least I can ask to, to allay my own fears of not understanding something. Um, so in a way, Anya is my um, partner in crime or partner in trying to answer those questions that you were, you're always in of thinking, I'm not sure what this means here. How do we want to interpret it? Ultimately, because translation is an act of interpretation. I, there's no such thing as a one-to-one -one translation. We are interpreting these poems for you and giving our interpretation. Speaking of which, of what we have just said, Mira, uh, about your interests uh, and work on translating Polish literature, we have a question from James Lubitz, who is wondering, uh, how did you get interested in Polish and, and Polish literature in the first place? Yeah, um, uh, so short, let's see, short version. <laughs> Um, ultimately, I found my way to an MFA program where Adam Zagajewski was teaching because I had started to read Polish literature and translation and was fascinated. Um, and then things kind of snowballed from there. Um, and I ended up going to Poland on a Fulbright fellowship and then doing a PhD in comparative literature so I could continue to, to learn Polish and read, uh, think about the, the, the um, dialogue between Eastern European and American poetry in the second half of the 20th century. Um, at the time, I... You know, I was interested in World War II, and of course, that history is always attendant when looking at poets like Miłosz and Herbert and the poets who were writing after the war or through the war and after the war. Um, but when I, when I was in Poland, people would always assume, oh, Rosenthal, you're here to study the Holocaust. And I'd always say, no, no, I'm here to study the poetry. But I feel like with this project with Ginchanka, I'm in a sense being more honest with myself for the first time, or I'm being brave enough to con not confront, but embrace my own Jewish identity and my own Jewish heritage in relation to what's always fascinated me for so long in terms of the literature. 
Thank you. So I can see now a few questions that I believe are directed to our historian in charge. <laughs> um, how are Zanna poems known to the literati? Did she publish pre-war or during? Did she have readings? Was her work only revealed after the war? And also, uh, okay, we have a question. Uh, what year Zdrada was written? She, yes, she was, she was her, um, she started publishing very early on. She was the first poem um, she wrote when she was um, just barely a teenager. Um, she published her first vo volume of poetry in, um, I believe that her first poem was published in 1934. In 1935, when she actually went to Warsaw, her poetry uh, was not, not known yet, but she, but she, had contact with Tuvim. Tuvim was one of the um, artists who was promoting her. And when she came to Warsaw, she actually very soon sort of became part of, and, and, and her stories, her life is very much part of, you know, writing about, for example, Zimiańska, right? All those Bohemians, all those uh, group, of, uh, group of artists that were meeting in, co in coffee shops and um, in, in pre-war Warsaw. So she's, she's very much part of this world. If you actually look at sort of almost any book on the Warsaw pre-war world, Kinchanka is there as one of very few women, right? And she's um, not only, uh, you know, there's like maybe two or three women um, next to Kinchanka, she's also one of the youngest of them. Um, and sort of that, her beauty, uh, the fact that she's very young, the fact that she is surrounded by men who adore her um, is uh, a cause of many gossips that are very often hurtful to her. And she's dealing with this, again, writing poetry. Um, so yes, her, world, her poetry is known. Kets actually in her last book says that uh, she also uh, won, I think that was the, 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 one of her biggest accomplishments is winning um, you know, a competition that was uh, announced by Wiadomości Literackie and she won it in 1934. So this is one way why, how Tuvim actually knew her before she even arrived to Warsaw. Um, one thing I can, I can add to this that I think, I think Zdrada was definitely written before the Second World War. It's sometimes between, I think, 36, uh, 36, 39. So it's before the, the, the war. Um, but yes, she's known. The one thing that Katz actually pointed out, that's the thought I lost, the, the, what Katz is pointing out, that um, many people knew her as a poet, but very little paid attention to her poetry. So there's very little reviews. There are, I think, two or three reviews of her work, of her volume of poetry. So everybody speaks how talented and powerful she is and beautiful, and yet nobody talks about her work. I want to just say that actually what we mentioned when we were speaking uh, in, in a, a practice session earlier, that when we first, it was, I think, July, when we first started speaking about doing this event. And obviously, when we decided on the date that it's going to be April this year, we could not predict that this event will be more relevant because of the situation in Ukraine. And um, well, Ginchanka, of, of course, most of her, li her life lived on the territory of today's Ukraine. And we have a question about Ginchanka citizenship. Uh, if you could elaborate on that and respond to this question. Ginchanka had something. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. sorry. Uh, Ginchanka had something that is um, uh, known as Nansen passport. Um, she was born in the Russian empire that collapsed in um, you know, 1917. So she was um, officially stateless. And Nansen passport was given to those official stateless, um, and it was sort of um, internationally recognized as um, a travel document for refugees from uh, who are stateless from countries that didn't exist any, any longer. And I think because she had Nansen passport, her mother left for Spain. And um, so there is some mention in some of the works that her mother wanted her to join her in Spain before the Second World War. And yet she decided not to because she decided not to ban abandon her grandmother. Uh, who stayed in Rivna and actually uh, died there. I think you also just mentioned that I think it was the Russian that was spoken in her family, yet, you know, she decided to write in Polish. Um, so, okay. Uh, was Ginchanka religious? That's another question we received. Is there any <laughs> material about that? You are going to try? This is a hard one. <laughs> It's actually something that we have talked a lot about because there are so many biblical references in her poetry and we're constantly coming to that question of, 
you know, what is this doing here? What is this conveying about our sense of uh, religion? Um, but time and again, that that is uh, comes into our poetry as a challenge to uh, like traditional religious narratives. Um, I don't. I'm I'm trying to think of anything that we've come across in terms of what people know about her personal life. Do you know of anything, Anya? We know that um, her family was, uh, I mean, her grandmother was relatively, was very modern. She's sort of uh, recognizing Rivna as one, so, so very emancipated woman. Uh, she definitely didn't follow any Jewish traditions um, the way we sort of see them right now, but I don't think she was religious. She was very spiritual and she was drawing from many uh, religions around her. Uh, but I don't think we, we never found out anything whether she was religious, um, whether she was actually actively participating in any kind of organized religion. She was definitely spiritual and she's drawing on religion, religious stories on Jewish life a lot, a lot in her work. She's definitely in sort of a, a dialogue with a uh, religious world, including uh, Orthodox um, um, Jewish. Jewish. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, I think that we, I mean, we all mentioned about the renaissance of the interest of Ginczanka in Poland that we have seen in Poland in the last few years. Anya, you mentioned that currently everybody knows uh, about Ginczanka. She's widely known. Uh, I know that you both mentioned it in your part of the speech, but I still would like to, you know, maybe perhaps you could elaborate in your opinion, what is the reason, what is the specific factor that determined this renaissance? In your opinion, is it, do you think it's the value and the significance and the relevance of her poetry? Or is it her life story, the tragic life story? Or is it perhaps that her life story and actually her work uh, can be um, can be used in this um, in, in the Polish uh, Jewish studies? or perhaps it can also be viewed as a contribution to women's studies, the gender studies also that are being developed uh, in Poland today. In your opinion, uh, how, how would you view uh, this, this renaissance of the interest of Dinchanka in Poland nowadays? Well, I will just um, add on to that idea of this renaissance that I recently gave a talk about Ginchanka to students to students at Jagiellonian University to graduate students. Not a one of them had heard of Ginchanka before my talk. And their professor had to do some work to kind of prepare them for what I was going to be conveying. And I had to do more legwork than I thought I was going to have to do in orienting them to who Ginchanka was. Um, so yes, I think there's been this, this renaissance, but at the same time, well, so I'm actually headed to Poland for the year next uh, year on a Fulbright Fellowship to specifically work on this project. And one of my main questions is how well is she known? Okay. And then to get more of a, a handle on this question of why, um, I mean, I, I would say more, a little bit more anecdotally than, than based in uh, specifics that to me, this kind of rediscovery always re relies heavily on the narrative, the story, in particular, the tragic story. And it's something that's very problematic in, in my view and something that uh, we're doing some work around and how we present her work in English. Um, and one of the reasons why we're really, we feel very strongly about not presenting her picture uh, and to, to think about some feminist perspectives in how to uh, handle why people are interested in her work. But Anya, I'll let you add on to that. <laughs> I, I said earlier that everybody knows Ginchanka and then Mira comes and says, nobody knows Ginchanka. Uh, <laughs> Opinions are split. <laughs> well, I think, so I, I mean, I, I hear what Mira is saying and I, you know, deal a lot with students and Mira does too. And we know that we think that students know and they don't. Um, there is a lot of work done on Ginchanka. Maybe that's how I should phrase it. And uh, if anybody's interested in Jewish stories in, um, 
you know, literature and poetry, they're going to know who Minchanka is. There is a couple of documentaries, there were uh, exhibits, um, there are books, there are bio serious bi biographies. I mean, we're talking about three serious biographies within the last three decades. I mean, that's that's a, that's an accomplishment, right? There are volumes of poetry published and republished. There are uh, books with of essays, a conversation with her friends about what they remember about her. Um, there's tons of articles, scholarly, academic articles that are published by you know young people coming into the field, sort of studying um, her poetry. It's a tremendous amount of work, and it almost feels like you we are coming to this project and we really don't have to do any archival research. It's a very strange feeling for a historian that you know the archives are actually open. Um, you know, non omnis moria is being used as a uh, historical document, as an evidence in a trial against Khominova that took place after the Second World War, right? So it's actually, you know, um, the, the poem is a form of an accusation against uh, a Polish family, a Polish person that actually denounced her. So there is actually a lot of work. And even from that perspective, her work is, is interesting to historians. There is a lot of work um, on her. I think that it's a lot of that, you know, the um, of what Mira said, this interest in, and I think what you said, it's feminist, feminism, it's gender history, it's feminization of those uh, literary practices, it's bringing the female voices, but also, also wondering what those female voices mean, and I see them mostly as sort of a challenge to, you know, Polish uh, mainstream and the way we see Polish literature. I think it's also this fascination with Jewish stories. I mean, Poland is uh, experiencing for the last couple of decades, really revival, a renaissance um, of, you know, interest in Polish Jewish topics. And we can discuss, you know, sort of that topic from different perspective. I think that is uh, one of the reasons why there's so much interest in Ninchanka. She was young, beautiful and Jewish and exotic. And she's writing in Polish, right? She is coming from the margins and you know going straight for um, uh, the center. She is trying to become active in Warsaw at Zimiańska Cafe, right? So she's really be trying to become the Polish mainstream among men. I teach a class on my campus that is titled Restless Woman and Mira was a guest in this class. And I think she's perfect example of restless woman, somebody who is sort of trying to rewrite her own story, but also rewrite the stories of how we actually see uh, Polish Jewish literature, somebody very much from the margins, somebody who's imposing this request to actually take intersectionality seriously in analyzing what Polishness means. And I think her beauty is definitely uh, a factor here. I keep remembering about this one book by Jarosław Mikołajewski, who actually says that he's in love with Linchanka and he cannot stop loving her and he cannot understand the sentiment. And it's kind of crazy, right, to sort of make that kind of public statement in a book by a man about a beautiful but dead um, Jewish poetess. So I think there's a lot of emotions uh, in it. And what's beautiful about this is that we don't see that much fascination with poetry, especially female poetry. Um, and I think poetry sort of offers a lot of venues to discuss, you know, larger, larger topics. The, the, the last thing I'll say is that what's interesting, I think, is that everybody here knows, well, everybody, Everybody, a lot of people know of Ginchanka, but they probably don't know her poetry. Like I imagine that a lot of people who know who Ginchanka is never read her poem. Maybe, you know, the one that non omnis moria. Thank you very much, uh, Anya, for these remarks. So based on what you both just said, uh, we can assume that this interest of Ginchanka will continue to grow and rise. Uh, um, thank you once again for joining us for this episode in our literature series. Thank you all our attendees for joining us today and for your great questions. Have a great rest of the day. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye.